Flint, Michigan. The very first GM car. High end assembly plant. This city was the Silicon Valley. The 50 million General Motors car. Of the day. So Flint, who can you trust, took around seven years from the moment I started making the film through until completing it and getting it out to an audience. We recorded must be 350 hours of footage over the time I was making the film. I used a Canon C300, uh, an original version. It's a camera I've used for many years now and made several feature documentaries with. I would normally work alone, partly because you build that trust up with the people that you're filming and following in the documentary. I find that that intimacy is something that's key to making a film of this nature. It has been five decades since Flint used the river for drinking water. Today, they open up the gates to start that process again. We need a countdown. Three, two, one. Here's the plan. The Flint River has been a dumping site for a hundred years. The thought that we would actually be drinking this. What did you set out to document in Flint? And how did that change mm. during, over the period of filming? Well, I arrived in Flint in 2015. I'd just shown a, a, a previous film at Michael Moore's Film Festival in Traverse City and then did a, a follow-up screening in Detroit, just down the road. And somebody at that screening said to me that I should come through to Flint because there were problems with the water there. And so I just went through to Flint and it was before it became a big news story. And there I found residents telling me that they had been jumping up and down for over a year at that point since the water source was switched from the Great Lakes to the Flint River, the contaminated local river. And they had been raising the alarm about the colour of the water, the smell of it, the fact that they were losing hair, that uh, skin rashes unexplained were, were appearing on their bodies, and nothing was being done. I mean, they'd taken their fight to the uh, mayor uh, of the city and also to the Michigan governor, Rick Snyder, nothing was being done. As things began to emerge, the residents did this citywide water test and leading professor in water, Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech, oversaw that testing. And then a local pediatrician made the link between the switch from the Great Lakes to the Flint River and a high rise in lead levels in children in Flint. And then it became a story of the world's press and media descending on the city that I'd been in um, on my own for several months by that stage. And then it struck me that as soon as the cameras left, the people of Flint were left in this complete vacuum of not knowing who to trust because they were being told that the water uh, was now as safe as any other city in America since the water was then switched back to the Great Lakes, but it was too little too late and the damage had been done to the uh, health of, of people in the city. They'd been consuming, according to Professor Mark Edwards, toxic waste levels of lead and the impact that that had on them and then this vacuum of trust that was created then really became the story, and that's how it changed initially. That's enough lead to cause lead poisoning in more than 3,000 children. We have just altered the life course trajectory of an entire generation of Flint children. What you just described is kind of like the second half of this mm. documentary, the erosion of trust. Was there a particular moment that kind of crystallized that narrative to you while you were filming? Do you remember being there? Yes, I mean, there were a number of times where I, I felt that the trust was being really shattered for, for people in the city of Flint. Firstly, it was when uh, they were told that they should use a filter and that the water would then be safe. And then the EPA issued a statement saying that actually, because the toxins of the water were so high, that filters wouldn't catch all of the contaminants in the water. So they were being told one thing and then another. And that kind of themselves having to do the research, if you will, and trying to understand what the truth of the matter was, that was really, really difficult for people. Barack Obama came into Flint. And I think as a majority African-American town, people were 
so looking forward to his visit. This was the moment where the President of the United States, they felt, was going to say, look, we're going to bring some federal support into the city. We're going to make sure that all the pipes, the lead pipes are ripped out of the ground and replaced all of them, and we'll provide the money for that. And it, none of that happened. He came to Flint and instead he stands there in front of the camera and drinks the water, which for the people of Flint felt like a huge betrayal. There's nothing more fundamental to your life than water. For that to be what can actually hurt you, cripple you, or kill you, is something that you could never get over. You were there filming yourself when Edwards was out helping people collect samples. And you were also there when Scott Smith appeared and started collecting samples. Did you notice red flags in either of those filming while you were there? Well, Professor Mark Edwards is one of America's leading experts on water quality. And he has a terrific scientific team behind him at Virginia Tech University. Mistakes were made definitely um, along the way by everybody, I think, in Flint. But when you had Mark Ruffalo come in uh, and his water defense group and uh, this character, Scott Smith, Smith, who was billed as the chief scientist of water defense to begin with. They downgraded that title to chief technology officer as time went on. But to begin with, it was a chief scientist. He was billed to people as somebody who had this terrific expertise of going into disasters all over the world and finding out what the truth was. And so when I saw this water bug device brought out, which was this sponge technology, which he said captured all these contaminants in the water, the residents weren't being told about. I, like the residents, was watching this thinking, you know, this seems to make sense because how else do you explain the skin rashes, the hair loss? That's not to do with lead. So there was this unexplained part of the story, the Legionnaire's disease also, which claimed 12, at least 12 lives officially, but many believe there were many more deaths than that because of the high death rate from pneumonia. So yeah, I, I think that the, like the residents, I was believing what I was seeing, but as time went on, it just became clear that this wasn't scientific. This certified lab I use is really where the science is. These folks are dangerous. I do not trust any of them. As a documentarian, how do you yeah. find resolution in a conversation about something that isn't resolved? Filmmakers will be familiar with the commissioning editor who says, well, how is this story going to end? Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to put money into this because we don't know how it's going to end. And I always hate that answer because that's the nature of real life. We never know how a story is going to end. The story of Flint continues today appallingly. You know, the people of Flint are still going through terrible stuff because of the decisions, the wrong and bad decisions that were made. They've had to watch these court cases start, stop, nobody being held to account. They haven't received a cent of compensation for the damage done to them. And yet the story continues and, and the media has moved on. But the story of Flint hasn't ended. And as a filmmaker, you just have to come to a point where you say, right, okay, I've followed this for five years now. That's a good length of time in anybody's book. And it's a really complex story and it came to some kind of an ending. So that was one thing. But the reality on the ground in Flint continues. The difficulty for people continues today. And people should be going back and following up with the children um, you know, who were contaminated in this terrible way and all the people of Flint to really understand the impact that this terrible mismanagement of public money and well-being and health and safety of, of an entire population of a city uh, were dealt with. It's defined by not knowing who you can trust in a society that runs on trust. 